I'm Rob Boss. Welcome to my crib. Come on in. <sighs> my oh my, it's good to be home. You know, oftentimes when we're out and exploring the world, I often forget about painting and you know, I find painting we use to express our emotions and we can tell stories with our art. And this is me and my trusty canvas here, which I have covered in titanium white, my trusty easel. And again, like I was saying, my favorite thing about painting is that we use it to express our emotions and our feelings and we tell stories with our happy little clouds and our happy little trees and our happy little sun. But also, we can use painting to go back in time and explore history and philosophical thoughts. And one thing I want to do for you ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls today, is explain one of my favorite philosophical dialogues by Plato. And this dialogue is called The Protagoras. Alright folks, we're here, let's talk about this Protagoras that I love so much, this work of Plato. Alright, so in the Protagoras, Socrates, the main philosophical character, he loves to find out the simplest things in life, and he wants to find out the meanings of virtue. Virtues, justice, courage, temperance. He wants to find out what these really mean in the Protagoras. So, he goes up to Protagoras, who is a sophist, who teaches people. He claims to teach people how to be more virtuous and how to better themselves as a person. Now, Socrates wants to figure out what exactly the basic claims are of Protagoras. So Protagoras tells him that he teaches sound deliberation both publicly and privately. Privately in one's household, how to manage one's household, and publicly as in how to recognize one's political potential. And today we're going to talk about the argument that Socrates raises to Protagoras and kind of how he, he questions him. And what Socrates says is that he doesn't think virtue is teachable because the people in Athens don't recognize experts in virtue, whereas they recognize experts in shipbuilding and house building and shoemaking and such, so on. So today we're going to focus on Protagoras' response to that argument about how virtue is not teachable. And, and, and specifically, we're going to focus on Protagoras' great speech. And in this great speech, we're going to focus on the myth that Protagoras uses to show Socrates that people already have virtue in themselves and how virtue is recognized within Athens. But before we start, we must use our trusty paints over here. All right, so we're gonna use some ivory black, a little bit of cerulean blue, and use some burnt sienna here. Remember, don't forget our titanium flat, which is one of our most important. We can use some deep yellow. Uh, we'll use a little green, maybe some phthalo green and ultramarine. Actually, you know what? It'll be nice and look crimson red. All right, now let's get set up, and I'll see you in a bit. All right, folks, so we're going to start some painting here. Like I said, I've covered my canvas with a little bit of titanium white. You can also do it with some gesso. As I said, we're focusing on the conversation between Socrates and Protagoras, who is one of the most well-known sophists at the time. All right, so here we're going to be painting Socrates with a little red rope, a little red sash that he liked to wear. All right, and now we're going to do Protagoras over on this side. I know he doesn't have arms, but we're going to do some red. And the problem here is virtue. That is what is in question. I'll put a little question mark here. Now that I've taken you away from the canvas, we're going to talk a little bit about this myth Protagoras uses to answer Socrates' response to what he claims to teach. Remember, this myth is about how all humans are virtuous. So the first part, we have to imagine way far back where all mankind and animals and plants were first being created. And in the Greek... Greek history, there were two gods who were in charge of kind of giving everything their power and abilities in all the world before it was supposed to be unleashed into being. 
And these two gods we have are Prometheus and Epimetheus. And Epimetheus really wanted to do all of this himself. He wanted the ability to give everyone power and stuff, and you know, give all the animals their powers and abilities. So he begged Prometheus to do it, and Prometheus agreed, but on one condition, that Prometheus could check it out after he was all done. Hey guys, all right, we're back at the canvas here. Now we're gonna do a little demo of uh, part two of Protagoras' great myth. So as I mentioned, we have two gods over here. Now earlier we drew Socrates and uh, Protagoras, but up here we're gonna draw the two other gods over here. So we gotta make a nice round head. Give him a little beard. And another one for Prometheus over here. So this is Epimetheus and this is Prometheus. Now remember, Prometheus is out of the picture right now, so we're only going to be focusing on Epimetheus. And these are all his creations over here. Forget about Socrates and Protagoras. So we're going to do a nice little tree. And we'll do one more little image. Um, this is all from Epimetheus, so we'll put a little green dot because he created that nice little tree. And we're going to put a little bird on here. Bird says chirp chirp. Alright, and there's a little nest. And now over here, this is the main problem that we want to focus on. This is the main problem that uh, Prometheus sees once he evaluates a Prometheus at work. We got a little person over here. A little human being. And he has nothing because Epimetheus just focused on all the animals and all the well, the plants, because remember, the beings have to come out into being in the next day. So Prometheus is worried about all the humans and how all the animals around them will do a little blobs and animals over here. Let's say this is like a, it can be a cow over here. All right, folks, we're back here on the couch. I hope you're at home enjoying a nice cup of tea, following along with my part one, part two, and part three of this great myth. And now that you've seen part one and seen that Epimetheus didn't really give the humans any power and Prometheus was very worried and upset, we're going to take a look at part two and see what Prometheus does about this. So now we're going to look at part two and see that Prometheus actually does something that all the other gods frown upon. What he does, he steals wisdom and practical knowledge from the gods. He seals uh, practical wisdom from Athena, and he seals the art of fire, and he gives this to the humans. We're gonna see how this kind of maps out and see what Zeus has to say about this later on. So let's head back over to the canvas. I'll kind of do a little demonstration of part two, all right? So here we get our little intro here with Socrates and Protagoras, and they're investigating virtue. And then over here in part one, which we did a little while ago, got Epimetheus and Prometheus and they're investigating or actually they're trying to give people the abilities they're investigating how to start the world and how to give animals and plants powers people powers but Epimetheus seems to have given everything else powers but left humans blank so Prometheus says something very very scary in the Greek god sense he goes to Athena he takes practical wisdom the very basic wisdom he gives a rap to the humans in order to, for them to be able to survive because he's wiped. He's worried that the human race is going to be wiped out. So we'll just give them a nice little little angle here so you can tell there's a couple layers of logs over here. And so this is the first thing Prometheus gives to the humans because they were left bare. Next thing I'll show you in one sec. Now that we see Prometheus giving them the power of fire the basic survival needs we're gonna I'm gonna show you exactly what else he gave him alright you may ask why did I draw a little circle on top of his head 
And the reason is because we're going to do a little light bulb in here that represents practical wisdom. And you may think practical wisdom that they have knowledge of a bunch of stuff, but they do not yet possess the art of politics, which is needed for a group of citizens to come together and survive together. They only have basic survival needs, and Zeus is still worried about the human race coming to an end because they're still not able to sustain all their values. All right, and we'll head over to talk about part three coming up. Hey there again, we're back here. All right, so now that you've seen part two, let's go to the final step of this great big myth that Protagoras uses. Looking at part three here, we're gonna see what Zeus does now that he finds out what Prometheus did. Oh, you guys beat me to it. We're back here at the canvas again. And right now, I'm gonna demonstrate part three of what's going on after Zeus finds out that Prometheus gave, or actually stole the art of uh, fire and basic knowledge from Athena. So what Zeus does, we're gonna represent Zeus in a little crowd here. We'll do a little line of nice cerulean blue. Take a little bit of our titanium light and we're just gonna blend it in to create these kind of clouds. All right, so remember the humans already have basic survival needs with fire and these kind of practical instincts. But Zeus, who we're going to represent as the thunder and lightning god, will do a little lightning bolt. This is going to represent Zeus. And we'll draw Zeus with a little bit of black here. He'll be this god right here. This is Zeus riding on his thunder and his lightning bolt. Zeus is looking at all these humans down here who only possess, possess practical wisdom who are still getting eaten by animals they don't have enough knowledge to communicate they don't have the art of politics to form cities so what he does he sends a messenger named Hermes who we're gonna put up here Hermes is gonna be this guy right here he's Zeus's messenger it's gonna come down with two things as I mentioned justice and shame and he's gonna give it to everyone so we'll put a little we'll put a little J here for justice and a little S here for shame and now that every one of these humans possesses justice and shame now they're able to form relationships we're gonna illustrate that with a big heart because they're able to form relationships and bonds with other humans. And because they all, every single one of them, possess the virtue of justice, they're able to form cities and connect with one another. So this guy's going to connect with this guy. And everyone is now happy in this great city. And this is the conclusion to Protagoras' great myth. And the reason that everyone already possesses virtues in themselves, everyone has justice and shame. And that's all right. That's all we need to know. And that is the great explanation for Protagoras' response to Socrates' argument. Thanks for joining me here, the Joy of Thinking. I'm Rob Boss. Now that you guys know some more about some other philosophical points of interest, you're going to be ready next time, next episode of the Joy of Thinking. Remember to purchase this. You can purchase online or at my own gallery, robboss.com. Over and out.